Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Brother Johanse Bediako, and this is Is Ancient Africa, the Nile Valley, the Source of Freemasonry? Uh, this has been a, a big debate among Masons for, for years. Um, and what I want to do and what I plan to do is to show you how and that it is true that ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt or the Nile Valley is the source of Freemasonry. Okay, uh, let's start off. We're going to start off with me, uh, who I am. And it doesn't want to go up. There we go. All right. I'm Brother Johanse Bediaco. Uh, I was taught by numerous of African scholars uh, back at the time period of a very young age at 17 years old. At 17 years old, I met and hung out with scholars like Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan. Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. George Simmons, Dr. Amos Wilson, Dr. Naeem Akbar, just to name a few. And there's others that I've also talked, that I've also been taught by too. Um, Dr. Ben was probably, out of all of them, one of the ones that I was closest to, Dr. Ben and Dr. Amos Wilson. I know them pretty well. Uh, Dr. Ben, who was born in Ethiopia and initiated into Freemasonry and the ancient mysteries of the Nile Valley as it was passed down to the brothers and sisters of Nubia. If you can go to the Nile Valley today and you talk among the brothers and sisters in Nubia, the culture is somewhat still alive. Um, not in the same glory as it was back in ancient times, but they still do certain initiation processes and they still have the same uh, uh, values and concepts going on. Um, in 1980, uh, Dr. Ben announced that he was going to start a chapter or start a branch of that mystery system in the United States. This is in Harlem, New York. And I am the second generation of that initiation. So he called for the brothers and he, he invited brothers to come. They came, they initiated the first group. And then when they got ready to initiate the second group, I was a part of that second group of initiation. Um, I then transferred, because I went to New Jersey Institute of Technology, and then I transferred to Tuskegee University. And after I finished my studies at Tuskegee University in architecture, which makes me an operative and speculative mason, um, I went on to live in Cincinnati, Ohio. And in Cincinnati, Ohio, there was a group of friends of mine that I met at Tuskegee that were doing a lot of things in the community. And I connected with them and worked with them in the community. And they were Prince Hall Masons. And they, um, and they asked me to then be a part of the lodge. And it was then that I agreed. At that time, I really didn't have any plans of being a part of the lodge. I knew my father was a Prince Hall Mason. And my older brother was a Prince Hall Mason. And my uncle was a Prince Hall but that's all I knew. I didn't necessarily have a desire to become a Prince Hall Mason, but because I worked in the community with these brothers and I went to school with them, I was like, okay, I will be initiated. I will go ahead and get initiated into the lodge. They also knew about me and my relationship with Dr. Ben and what he was trying to do in Harlem. So in 1993, I was initiated past the raise in the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, Pride of the Valley number 95. And that started uh, a lot of my work and my study in Freemasonry. What we want to do is, what I want to do is I want to set a concept for you, an idea around how we should look at and how we should deal with facts and information. And one of the ways and one of the things that is done particularly in academia and how they determine facts when some things doesn't necessarily have the facts to say, this is the process. Understanding mathematics is not just dealing with the physical reality or just teaching you how to quantify things and objects. It also teaches you concepts of evaluation, how you evaluate reality, how you see reality. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this very simple equation that is used in logic, right? And so 
we're going to start off with A equals B, B equals C, and then C equals D. These are the only facts that you have. You don't have any other facts around this. All you have is A equals B, B equals C, C equals D. So the question then becomes, what does D equal? Right? What does D equal? That's all you have is D equals C. You don't have any other facts. But based upon these facts, you also can logically come to the conclusion and be very accurate that D equals B and A. Right? So you can come to that conclusion because if D equals C and then C equals B, therefore D must also equals B. But if B equals A, and C equals B, and C equals D, then therefore D must also equals A. But there's no facts that says that. And this is a part of how factual evidence is determined based on when there's no real concrete thing that says it is. This is how facts are coming. So I want you to keep this equation in mind as we're going through and as we're discussing some of these concepts and ideas about uh, ancient Kemi or Nile Valley contributing to Freemasonry. Also understand that culture and behavior, culture sets behavior. There is no such thing as a behavior outside of a culture paradigm. Culture is what invents behavior. So there's no, no behavior that is neutral in the world. Since human existence, every human being's behavior is connected to a culture. There is no such thing as a neutral behavior. The way you eat, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you sing, the way you write, all of that is determined by culture. I can sit here and we can talk about, we can, I can say egg rolls and fried rice and you will have somewhat of a level of understanding of what cultural framework that comes from. Then I can turn around and talk about and say uh, zucchini, I mean, I'm sorry, say lasagna and start talking about that. And then you'll have an understanding of what a different culture I'm talking about. That is because culture sets behavior. So there's no, there's no neutral behavior in the world. So everything is produced from a culture. And what we're going to do as we talk about and we see these kinds of things, when you look at certain subtle differences, that is because when Europeans learned and started studying the concepts of Freemasonry in which they received and which they dealt with from the Nile Valley, they wrapped it and expressed it in their cultural paradigm. And so we're gonna subtly see some subtly differences, but we're gonna see exactly some of the, what is similarity and where it comes from. Okay. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna set some facts that we do have, right? I wanna set some facts that we do have. This, is, this comes from a book called The Builder by Joseph Newton, who was a Freemason. Um, one back up. Ah, there you go. All right. Uh, clear, the two nations were drawn closer together, and the fact carries with it a mingling of religious influences and ideas, as was true between the Hebrew and other nations, but especially Egypt and Phoenicia. During the reign of Solomon, now the, now, now the religion of the Phoenicians as to as this time is all agreed at this time as all agreed was the Egyptian religion in a modified form. So let's stop right there. It is already what is being established by Joseph Newton. He is saying that the Phoenicians culture, the Phoenicians belief system was established by the Egyptian just in a modified form. Again, remember when cultures get an understanding, they express that understanding through their paradigm. And so that's what he's, that's what he's explaining. Um, uh, Dionysus has taken the role of Osiris. Osiris is an Egyptian deity. 
of Osiris in the drama of faith in Greece, Syria, and Asia Minor. Thus, we have the mysteries of Egypt in which Moses was learned, brought to the very door of Temple of Solomon, and that to and that too at a time favorable to impress. So in other words, they're saying then that at this time that the Phoenicians influenced the that influenced the, the Greeks, influenced Greece, Syria, and Asia Minor. And so what happened is, is through that influence, the religious culture, the belief system, the mysteries of Egypt was brought to the Hebrew people through that. So again, A, Egypt, B, Phoenician, same. Phoenician, Greece, Syria, Asia Minor, the same. Asia Minor, Greece, Syria, Freemasonry, the same. So therefore, Egypt is the source of Freemasonry as it's been passed down through cultures and through generations of, of people in that, in that time period. Let's continue. Again, from the same book, the same book. Um, thereupon, the faithful son, when, when, in Sol when in Solomon, I mean, Solomon, when Solomon procession, to the grave of his father, open it and call it upon Osiris to rise. Stand up, thou shalt not end, thou shalt not perish. But death was but death was death. Here the pyramid texts recite the, the mortuary ritual, which is hymns and chants, but in vain. At length Osiris awakes, weary and feeble, and by the aid of the strong grip of the lion's paw was he gained control of his body and is lifted from death into life. Right? And so we understand now, we can see aspects and concepts of where Freemasonry again got the ideas from which they express. All right, this is from um, a weekly periodical that comes from the Grand Lodge of England. This is from a weekly periodical that comes from the Grand Lodge of England. Osiris Lee undoubtedly persons superior in mind and intelligence to the age in which they lived who organized society and contributed largely to the improvement of mankind, on which account the gratitude of after ages elevated them to the ranks of God. The mysteries of Isis are interesting to Masons as being the foundation of those of the Sudanian builders of Dionysus, the same people, the Phoenicians, architects, which have contributed to many elements to the Masonic rites. We're going to come back and again, we're going to and, uh, look at the group of people, the, the Sudanese, right? This is from the Encyclopedia of Freemason, right? Talking about the antiquity of Freemason, explaining the antiquity of Freemason. A part of the ritual of Freemasonry originated in Egypt and was engraved and grafted on the system of the Sudanian builders. Right, Sudanians, Phoenician, same people. And so they, what we're seeing is how Egyptian knowledge, the Nile Valley knowledge, is influencing all of the cultures and societies that are around them, including the Hebrews. All right. All right. Um, this is also, again, from the encyclopedia of Freemason. Osiris was the symbol of truth and goodness. Typhon, which was Osiris's brother who winds up killing him, or uh, of Typhon of Eret or Eden. The murder of Osiris signified the temporary subjugation of virtue and his resurrection, right? Murder, resurrection, theme that we've, been, that we've heard before, the ultimate triumph of the good. This was the parent of all those Grecian rites, which represented a death and a resurrection 
and whose principal features are perpetuated in the legend of the Sudan of the Sudanian builders. Right. So again, this is a, this this information and this understanding of the mysteries, this understanding of the knowledge and the information that Freemasonry talks about was passed through other cultures through Nile Valley to Phoenicia. All right. Um, this is back to the builders by Joe by Joseph Newton. Of the Egyptian origin of the drama of the third degree, there is little doubt, albeit there is no trace of it apparently in Hebrew lore. So, in other words, the whole idea of Hiram being killed and being raised from the dead, there is no, no character in Hebrew culture that has done that. So where are they getting the idea of a resurrected person? And that is because the knowledge and understanding of the Egyptians has been passed through generations to the Hebrew people. All right, so understanding that now, we're going to look at, we're going to now look at lodges, right? Now we're going to look at lodges. And here, what I'm, my thing is here is that other than European culture, that is, other than the expression of Rome and Greece, right? Other than that, because that's European, other than that, there is only one other culture that Masonic lodges will be decorated in, and that is Egyptian culture. You, have, you can travel around the world and you will not see a Masonic lodge decorated in ancient Chinese culture, ancient Native American culture, ancient Indian culture, nor ancient Arab culture. But with a simple press of a button on your computer, you will be able to find Masonic lodges from around the world decorated in ancient Egyptian culture. So the question becomes, if Egypt is not the source of Freemasonry, then how come so many lodges are decorated in ancient Egyptian culture? And if Freemasonry is a universal brotherhood and is made up of all different cultures, then how come you don't see Masonic lodges decorated, decorated in other cultures? That is because those cultures didn't influence Freemasonry. So then we'll go and we'll go to Durban, we'll go to, we'll go to D Dublin, Ireland, right? A Masonic room decorated in ancient Egyptian culture. There is no room in the lodge in Dublin, Ireland that's decorated in no Mesopotamian culture. There's no room in, in the lodge in Dublin that's decorated in ancient Chinese culture. But there's one decorated in ancient Egyptian culture. Why? No other culture is expressed. Here's Liverpool, England. Egyptian culture. No, no one, nothing, no other room expressed of no other culture. This is Mobile, this is yeah. Mobile, Alabama. Hey, go, go back to that other slide. Okay. Can you expand that picture right there so we can get a little closer for that room too? Turn it sideways. Turn it, yeah. yeah. Let's get a little closer to that picture of that room. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I want to get a really good look at this. See this, these, and 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 this, this, these two lodges I chose to show first because their spaces, their spaces are little. Bring it down. Think of their spaces are little. Let's move on. Mobile, Alabama. The Scottish Rites Lodge in Mobile, Alabama. Right? You're never going to see. Let me turn it back this way. Okay. You're never going to see a Masonic Lodge set up like an ancient Native American culture. You're not going to see that. So the question becomes, why is the obsession with ancient Egypt? No, 
Are you sure that's not from Greece? I mean, uh, what they say? No, we, I, we're going to get to that. I'm going to show you that this is not from Greece. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Right? This is the Grand Lodge of New York. Hmm. Grand Lodge of New York. Ain't no other room in the Grand Lodge of New York set up with no other culture. Right. Now. Are those hieroglyphs in the back of that room? Yeah. Oh, yes. That. Oh, yes. Expand that. Zoom, zoom See? in. Oh, wow. Hieroglyphs. Oh, yes. Hieroglyphs. Egyptians. In the wow. east. In the east. In the east. Where the sun rises. Where the right? Comes from. You ready? This is my favorite one. I'm trying to get here. Didn't plan a trip here. This is Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well. Look at that. Right? No other lodge in the world. I'm not just saying the United States. In the world, no other lodge has rooms decorated in other cultures other than Egypt. You can zoom in on the hieroglyphs on the pillar. I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. See that? That's ridiculous. This is Philadelphia Grand Lodge. <laughs> Maybe it's just a coincidence. No, I, I'm, look. Dublin. I'm, I'm just saying Dublin, what they're going to say. Liverpool, Mobile, New York, Philly cannot be a coincidence. And I just stopped at that. I could have did one from South America. I could have done one from Australia. I could have done, I just didn't want to continue to have all these these slides. Yeah, but really all over the world. Right? Right? You ready? This is this is the floor plan of Solomon's Temple. Right? This is the floor plan of Solomon's Temple. Now, some reality check. Right? Ain't no Solomon's Temple ever been found. They tell you the area. This is where Solomon Temple was. But ain't no temple there. Right? That is the temple in ancient Kim, one of them. The thing that I want you to look at, the area I want you to pay attention to, is this area. Right? You, you can pay attention that? to the whole temple, but pay attention. I think a black sound goes to big. Pay attention to this area, right? We're going to go back. Come on back up. Bring it down, strike it down. There it is, all right. You see? I'm going to go back. So the concept of Solomon's temple layout is patterned after an Egyptian temple. All right? The two columns, right? B and J, right? Two columns. We all pass between them, right? Two columns. Here we go. In ancient Kemet, every temple had what is called Tekken, or what Europeans will call obelisks in front of them. And every initiate being initiated into the system of ancient Egypt had to pass between those two texts. Same thing. Two columns. Oh, let's go back. All right, two columns. The two tech. So it's very clear that ancient Egypt is the source of Freemason. Right? Let's move on. Now here we go. The whole Masonic system, the whole Masonic system is built around the hue, the hue and fashioning of stones. The whole Masonic system is built around the hue and fashioning of stones taking a rough stone, smoothing it out, and fashioning it to be a perfect square, right? 
This is what the whole Masonic allegorical symbols are dealing with. Cures and fashionings of stone to be able to build the temple, right? Ancient Egyptian. Right? Cure and fashionings of stone. This was taken from a um, papyrus and that was taken from a temple in ancient Egyptian. Now, mind you, mind you, all of the pictures that I'm showing you of, e of, of things in Egypt were done before any European could write. They were done before any European could write. By time Europeans are writing, the Egyptian culture and the Nile Valley culture is an ancient civilization. They had already existed for almost 3,000 years. By time the first European is even starting to write. So what we're seeing then is we're seeing things that was very well established long before Europeans even became civilization. Now, working tools. This is one of my favorite ones. This is one of my favorite ones. Because if we was to think about Freemasonry, right, and we was to think about a symbol or symbols of Freemasonry, the working tools will come up first. The square, the level, the plum. Those would be the, the, the main things that would come up first. So as we see the square, the level, the plum, the trial, the setting mile, 24 inch gauge, right? And these are the working tools of Freemasonry. Well, these are the working tools in ancient Kim, or what we would call Egypt. They were, they were found in the temples, uh, step pyramid and, and, and the temple of Luxor long before, again, these were used long before Europeans was writing. Long before Europeans was writing. And as you can see, the square, the level, the plum, right? We go over to this. I can't remember this book. I had this book. Can't remember what it is, the name of it. But you'll see the trial, right? The chisel, right? The setting mark. All of these were found in the temples. And just to show you, right? Right there on, in the hieroglyphics. Or what the Egyptian would call metonature. The Egyptians didn't speak Greek, so they don't know anything about hieroglyphics. But they called it metonature. And you will see the working tool right there. Right now, I could have pulled up a whole bunch of other slides of metal nature showing the level and that in the metal nature also. But then again, like I said, I'll be using slide for you side of it. But this is also right here the ruler, 24 inch gauge. So these are working tools that had already been established and already been used by ancient Kim. We know that. The Phoenicians, we've already said that the Phoenicians learned from the Egyptians. We already said that the Phoenicians taught the Greece, and we know that Greece, that, that the Greeks philosophers and all of them traveled to Egypt to learn also. We'll get to that coming up further. Uh, we dealt with the human and fashion of stones. Here we go. Right? Do guards and signs. Okay. Now remember, again, cultures express things when they learn it, then they, then they give it back to the world through their cultural paradigm, all right? So these do guards and signs, right? Ancient Kemet, the grand hailing sign in ancient Kemet is a sign called the Ka, right? Ka sign, right? Five points of fellowship, right? Dugar, sign, 
right? Nothing new. Ancient Kimmy, Nile Valley civilization, right? This is a good one right here. Forty seventh problem of Euclid, right? Mm. Real good one right here. Because this is a double thing, right? Because the 47th problem with Euclid works also off of the Pythagorean theorem. All right. So if we read in the builder, this is coming from the builder, Joseph Newton again, Euclid was consulted and, re and recommended the oneness craft, the once craft of good masonry. And the origin of the order is founded, and this word means in Egypt land. All right, there it is, right there. In Egypt land. Why? Because Euclid learned mathematics in Egypt. That's where Euclid was. He spent most of his time in Egypt. Right? Maybe it's another coincidence. <laughs> well, we're going to have a lot of coincidences that we're going to have to stop calling coincidence. Let's go on, right? This, um, gosh, I can't remember where I got this, this from, right? This is talking about, start off, we're going to talk about the 47th problem of Euclid. Uh, this mathematical theorem has been called one of the foundations of Freemasonry. It is called the 47th problem for uh, no more esoteric reason than Euclid published a book of the theorem, of which this was number 47. All right, here's the next line right here. The 47th problem is also called the Egyptian string trick. That's what Europeans called it, the Egyptian string trick. And a practical demonstration in making the shape illustrated its efficiency perfectly that is that they use this string and we'll talk about it in right up below this is a part of how they used to lay out their land the when the nile flooded property property boundaries was erased and so the way they went back in and to determine the property bound boundaries they used this thing called that Europeans call the Egyptian string trade. All right. Um, so in this part, we see in building the pyramids, right? The ancient Egyptians constructed right triangles out of knotted rope as shown along alongside. That's this right here. So this is what they're talking about, the Egyptian string trade. Since, <clears throat> since the 12 knots in the rope are evenly spaced, it makes a three, four, five triangle. And because of the theorem of Pythagoras, we know the right, we know the angle in the left lower corner must be a right angle. Not knotted rope like this was used to ensure that the corners, that the corners in the base of the pyramids were all right angles. Right? Modern day builders still use the Pythagorean theorem to ensure that their buildings are square. Right? All right, here we are. This is just a continuation of talking about the knot. No. <clears throat> now, in his collection of essays entitled Morelia, Morelia, Volume 5, the Greek essayist Plutarch comments on the ancient Egyptians' knowledge of the 345 Pythagorean triple and this relationship between the sides of a right and right triangle expressed in ancient Egyptian symbolism by saying that this is what the Greek person said that was there in Egypt. The upright therefore may be likened to a to the male. That is this part. This part. The upright may be likened to a, to a male. The base to the female. This part. 
and the hypotenuse to the child of both. This part. And so a star or Osiris, that's what they call, which is right here, may be regarded as the origin. Aset or Isis, which you recall right here, as the recipient and Haru, Horus, they call right here, as perfect, as perfected result. Three is the first perfect odd number. Number three is the per first perfect odd number. Four is a square whose size is the even number two. So that means two times two is four. So four is based on two, then you have three. And so, <clears throat> but five is in some way like its father and in some way like like its mother being made up of three and two. So three, four, five, triangle, Os uh, Asar, Aset, Heru, Osiris, Isis, Horus. These are the concepts that the Egyptians have been dealing with long before Europeans was around. Now, I put in this right here to give you an even further understanding of how the Egyptians was dealing with the three, four, five triangle, or the people Kim, you know, three, four, five triangle. This is a deity called Mim. Mim is considered to be a masculine uh, representation of the rejuvenative power of a male, which is why he has an erect penis, right? And so, but. Mim is lying at an angle with the snake going at the base and coming up back to his head. When you project a triangle over his angled body, you will come out with a triangle in the proportion of a three, four, five triangle. And this was done in the temple walls. This was done in the temple walls. You'll find this in a book called Egyptian Miracle by a French Egyptologist, a really good French Egyptologist. I suggest all Masons get his book called Egyptian Miracle. His name is Swaller de Lubis. I don't know how to spell his name. So, but all you gotta do is look up Egyptian Miracle on the internet and his name will come up. He also wrote another book, which is really good, called Temple in Man. That's better than, than Egyptian Miracle. But both of those two books, I suggest all African American Masons get. All right. Um, all right. Cornerstone, right? Brother Melvin, we ain't finished with the coincidence. We still got some more to go. No, this, no, <laughs> so this is just another coincidence. Okay. Can't, okay. Can't this is another coincidence. Cornerstone, right? Cornerstone ceremony. A big, a very important and significant ceremony in um, in Freemasonry. Now, why do they talk about the cornerstone? Because in the laying out of masonry, when you lay out the bricks and the stones in masonry, it is the corners that are set first, because everything in the middle and going up is guided by the corners. So they set first. And so the cornerstone is, a, is the stone, significant stone in the building of a stone structure, all right? This symbol is called Ma'a. Ma'a relates to another deity called Ma'at. Ma'a means perfect measure. Now, why Ma'a? Why is this? Because what this, this hieroglyphic or this metonetta represents, what this metonetta represents is the cornerstone of a pyramid. And so philosophically and soundly, you will see a lot of the deities in ancient Kemet standing on Ma'a, right? Because the foundation of your act the foundation of your behavior, the foundation of your character is supposed to be true. 
and correct. And so you will see the kinetic deities standing or sitting on Ma'a. And so Ma'a is a cornerstone. It is that part, this part of the pyramid. Now, I put this in here for you to see. For you to see the Ma'a, right? For you to see it. This is an early picture of the base of the pyramid. But it is afterwards when the Arabs, the Arabs came in and they started to find this is afterwards the vandalism that has happened to the pyramid. Because you see this stone, this covered the whole pyramid at one time. They stripped it all off, right? And so my eye, another coincidence. <laughs> another co co my eye represents the cornerstones, but the so that those stones have to be set perfect because not only see, not only did then did it line the pyramid going width and depth. But it also means that the angles going up all had to come to a point. So that means my eye had to be set so accurately that as they build and as they went up, it was so accurate that the points of the edges of the pyramid actually came together. So again, cornerstone, ancient chemical, long before European. All right, now, this one annoys me, all right? This one annoys me. In the Masonic system, we have the five orders of architecture, right? Right, Truscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, Composite. Why are they the orders of architecture? How are they? If, if Freemasonry is an ancient system that dates back to antiquity, then why are they the orders of architecture? How do they become the orders of architecture when there are other cultures that are building long before them? Because when people get information and they get an understanding, they express it through their own cultural values. These are the columns of ancient Kemet. Now, I only chose five just to relate to, to the five orders of architecture. All right, so I only chose five. I only chose an image of five of them just to relate to the five orders of architecture, but there actually are eight. There are eight different types of columns of ancient Kemet. One of them is the Doric column of Greece actually was first built in ancient Kemet. I just didn't bring that one up. But these are the columns of ancient Kemet, right? The budded, the budded, I mean, I'm sorry, not the budded, the, um, the open lotus, the budded lotus, the budded papyrus, the open papyrus, and this is a heteru column, right? They also have an Osiris or an Asar column. I didn't put that up, you know? So these columns, not only are they three times larger than the Etruscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite, they are way older, right? But if Freemasonry- <laughs> That coincidence is heavy, right? That coincidence is heavy. If Freemasonry is an ancient system, then I could have understand them putting a Doric, then one of these, and then I didn't put up, I didn't put the images of ancient Chinese columns. See, then, then that would make me think that your system that you're creating is actually universal, as opposed to European, because this is Greek and Rome, 
I thought I was going to say, yeah. Those this are the is Greek, Greek and Rome. Truscan and Doric is Greek. I, uh, Ionic, Corinthian, composite. Composite is nothing but these two put together. So as you see the curly piece right here, you see the curly piece right there, and the flower right there, and the flower right there. Isn't Greece and Rome, are they located in the Mediterranean? Yes, they're oh, located okay. in the Mediterranean and the hot skipping and jumping. Oh, it's another coincidence. Yes, another coincidence. Oh, here we are. Now, another lodge, this is another one. I just didn't put up the name. This is another Egyptian one, right? Can you expand on it? Yeah. I know it goes out when you expand some time, but still we get. So basically, it spread from Egypt yeah, it went down. to well, the Middle see. East into the Mediterranean. No, from, from Egypt, Egypt to the Middle East and the Mediterranean, and, and, um, and then to Rome and Greece. So and then it, to is Europe. it a coincidence that it went in a straight path pretty much? Oh, that is, yeah, that's it went straight. That was the intention, right? No, yeah, that's sense. the that's the easy way for it to it to travel. Uh, come on now. All right. Now I didn't I didn't I I I was gonna use this this lodge in Egyptian uh in my showing of the Egyptian thing like because this lodge wasn't in my Egyptian list, but clearly you can see this is another lodge set up in the pattern of the Egyptian. I use this lodge because I thought this lies hell. This starry canopy that was off the chain, right? I so I that I used it because of its representation of the starry canopy. Very few lodges actually have a starry canopy in it, right? Right. Ancient Egypt starry canopy. This is a starry canopy in the temple of Hatshepsut. And this is a starry canopy in the, in the temple of Luxor, or Waset if it, in ancient Egyptian. Starry canopy. That's just a coincidence, though. Another coincidence, right? Another coincidence. Well, let's continue. <laughs> Masonic cable tub, right? Masonic cable tub. This rope that connects us, right? In ancient Egypt, they had a ceremony at the beginning of the building of the temples called stretching the cord or oh, that's what it's translated into called stretching the cord stretching the cord ceremony was dedicated to a feminine deity called shishite shishite represented the stars and and um and astrology astronomy i'm sorry my ancestors didn't do astrology they did astronomy astronomy and stretching the cord was a ceremony in which helped the temples align with star patterns and the east. Now, I want you to pay attention to this because we're gonna come back to this right here. This is, Shishite is right here. And this is um, the ceremony of stretching the cord. This is a part of the symbols of stretching the cord, right? But we're gonna come back to that. So the whole idea of a cable toe, as you can see, the cord is wrapped around his arm. You see the rest of the cord wrapped around his arm and he has it in his hand. You know, so the whole idea of the cord and the cable toe is um, nothing new. Okay, so would it be safe to say that the bottom picture, so if it was like 20 people, they will all have the rope around the yeah, arm. Oh, well, I just, didn't, I just didn't show I the, yeah, I just okay. didn't show the rest of them, right. They yeah. will all have the rope. There's kind another- Kind of like cable toe of, of a lodge. Yes. But that's gonna be argued, and again, it's just, just, it's just a just similar a, coincidence. Just a, just a coincidence. Yeah. All of these things- Because the rope's not around the neck, so 
So that's what right. they're going to do. Right. It's not around. But then again, like I keep saying, let me give you an example, right? Let me show you an example. No, the rope is not around your neck, it's not around your waist, right? But right. this look, again, when you get information, you, you express that through your own culture. This look is the look of European prisoners when they're going to be executed. This is what they look like. Right? And the whole concept of the initiation process is that you are doing what? You are dying and being born into a new consciousness. Right? We all know that because that's the whole thing of Hiram the Fifth. All right? So, hey, I'm trying to move this up here. <laughs> so, so, all they did was take this concept and express it within their own cultural paradigm. All right? like he's wearing the same thing that guy's wearing. Yep. So let's keep going. Coincidence. Right? All seeing eye. Right? There is no precedent in European culture to do this. What about the dollar bill? I thought it came from the dollar bill. Came from the dollar bill. No precedent in European culture. That means if you go back to 100 AD, you will not see this symbol in European culture. If you go back to, to, to 900 AD, you will not see this symbol in European culture. This symbol doesn't become a part of European culture until Europeans start to deal with higher learning, which they were taught from the Moors, which established the Renaissance. And then you get this, right? Because that comes from this. Oh. Another coincidence. Yes, this right? is a coincidence, yeah. This ancient, is a coincidence. Kemet, ancient Kemet, the eye of Heru or the eye of Ra. All in court because Kim is an ancient civilization within its own existence. So, in other words, Rome is ancient because Rome was back in 100, 100 AD, 100, and Greece was back in 300 BC. That's why it's ancient. It's not ancient because Rome is old. Kimmet was ancient before Kimmet fell as a civilization. It was in existence for 4,000 years. So when you look at a culture that has developed over time, you will get things like stuff representing two different things. So you will have this representing as the eye of Ra and the eye of Haru, or the eye of Horus, as they white folks would call it. Right. One goes to the left, and then one goes to the right. One goes to the left, one goes to the right. Horus is the left. Because it, his eye, left eye, was um, ripped out in his battle against his brother who killed his father. The right is rock, right, set. Right. So, so again, no coincidence, or is it? Yeah. It's just, a, it's just a, it happened, luckily. Luckily, just happen. It may be, have just happened to be these things. Well, let's continue. Well, maybe that happened accidentally, <laughs> and just some, somebody had a dream. Right. Somebody had a dream and built a whole system that just happened to coincidentally with almost everything they do relate to another culture. All right. Um, again, I. I could have um, this this presentation would could I could have done this presentation for four hours showing the similarities, you know. Um, yes, you this yes, you this is the this is the seat of Osar or the seat of Osiris, and when you start to apply 
the proportions to the seat of Osiris, you will see that it builds or it comes out to having a square. Right? Let me read. The throne upon which Osiris sits is clearly depicted as the square of four. Right? Um, as it as it transforms into the square of five through the principles of the square root of five on which all of five proportions rest. If you know anything about five, five is a ratio that the Greeks um, built upon, Kim builds upon two, um, that is a ratio that appears in nature. 1.618. It constantly appears in nature and all, and you'll find that that ratio is the ratio in which the natural world grows and builds. And so, um, so five, it is therefore shown as the seat of the world of transformation through death and rebirth represented by Osiris. All right. So. The difference in ancient Kemet and Freemasonry is Freemasonry stands on the square, ancient Kemet sits on the square. <laughs> All right, so, so um, some people argue and say that it's totally different since somebody stands and somebody sitting. Again, <laughs> I'm just playing yeah. devil's advocate. Yeah, right. of, they can say it's different if they want. All right. But at that point, they'd just be lying. To yeah, they'd just be lying. They'd just be lying. All right. Another one of my favorites. Royal art, right? Uh -oh. Royal art. Come on now. Come on back to me. Come on back to me. Oh, this wonderful keystone, right? It's wonderful. It's keystone. all about the keystone. All about the keystone, right? King Tyree get a little bit of play in that house. Booyah! Right? He's the men on that. See it? Went down. I might turn it side. Okay, I said, well, well, well. Look See at it. that. Is that look at that. Look at that. Right? That's a coincidence. That's a coincidence. All of these arches, right? I thought the Romans were known for making arches. Yeah, when they learned it from the Egyptians how to build them. Okay, we back. So, as you see, the, the concepts of building arches and all of that, right? Ancient Kemet, long before Europeans knew how to write. All right, let's go. Ooh. The altar, right? The altar. Um, a good book to read to understand the antiquity and the ancient origin of Freemasonry is a book called Signs and Symbols of Premortal Man by Albert Churchmark, who was a Mason also. All right. Masonic Altar. Center of the Lodge, the lifeline of the Lodge. Right? Masonic Altar. Ancient Kemet. Altar, altar. Most people do not understand that the Sphinx or Haru Am Aket, which is what people in Kemet called it, Haru Am Aket, and the Sphinx is actually a temple that goes down, enter, you go down into the ground is a temple inside there, inside the temple. But before, you enter the temple, there is a whole cleansing ceremony and process in which you do before the altar. And things is where Alexander the Great got soft tablets, soft being the inventor of letters, right? Right there. That's the tablet that he's talking that you're talking about. Right there. So the inventor of letters came to Egypt and Alexander the Great credits for that. Mm -hmm. So what about his nose? Oh yes. I'm sorry, I ain't got nothing to do with masonry, does it, it? it? Well, it got something to do considering that 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 the person that did it 
um, uh, Napoleon was a Mason. When Napoleon came into ancient Kemet, there was nothing showing but the Sphinx but his head. All of this was buried under, under the ground. And when he saw it, he saw that it looked like African people. What? So he got angry and he lined up 21 cannons and shot the nose off. Hmm. 21 gun salute. Why he shoot the nose off? Because it reminded him of the people that he scorned, right? Black folks can't, can't do that. Oh, okay. I was just, just wondering about it. All right. All right. Another good one that I like. <laughs> St. John's Equinox, right? Hmm. Holy St. John. The patterns of the sun traveling through the sky, going from the winter equinox to the spring equinox. A constant pattern, right? That shows us of our movement through life. And that we are constantly going from life to death, to rebirth. Spring equinox, birth, winter equinox, death. All pattern of the sun. Now remember I told you to remember the image of Shishak. So we get to the image of Shishai. Same thing. Winter, spring equinox, and the rope representing the traveling from one to the other. Circle of life, constant, living, dying, rejuvenating, being born again. That's a coincidence again. That is a coincidence. That is a coincidence again. All right, all right. Let's move. Masonic apron. No, come on. It can't be on the apron, too. <laughs> Masonic apron. All right. I specifically just chose brothers to represent this. I wasn't going to show. I was going to do George Washington, but I think George Washington is an asshole. So and those guys PHA or is that um one is PHA and I don't know what they are. I just made sure that I didn't do PHA I don't know. You should have put George Washington on there. Okay. So <laughs> so Masonic apron, right? Supposed to go back to the what? Rome, Roman, Roman. Right? Is that what it is? Right? So, let's see. Breeze. Okay, so here we are. The Kemetic apron, right? An Egyptian apron. And then as you can see, the apron being worn by the representation of the Pharaoh making offerings to the deity. These aprons and our concepts of that the apron is nothing new. The whole idea has been a part of ancient African customs and tradition for a very long time. All right. These are these. Yeah, but everybody wore aprons, so they, you know. Yeah, but we're the first. All right. So. So. <laughs> so. Uh, this is just, just to show you that it isn't just the Nile Valley, right? Just to give you an understanding that it isn't, it isn't just the Nile Valley, right? This is a symbol called the Dakinga from the Congo. And what the Dakinga represents is their, their belief is that every life, right? Every life is like and represents like a rising sun. Mm. All right? 
Heard that like before, the rising right? Sun. The rising sun. And and from the Congo. And from the Congo. And the pattern is, is that you rise, you go up to adulthood, then you come down to elder and eventually pass away and become an ancestor and your spirit goes back into the spirit world or the afterlife. This line right here represents water because you're born through water. And the part up here, this is called Ku and Sika. Ku and Sika is life, is the living. Ku and Pimba is death or the spirit world. And you travel in a counterclockwise manner around the symbol. Counterclockwise manner. You travel in a counterclockwise manner. When you travel around the lodge, what direction do you travel? In a counterclockwise manner, right? And so this is a symbol um, that is very much so a part of the people of the Congo. Again, the sun being the symbol, the rising, the high noon, the setting of the sun. The only difference is, is in the Masonic Lodge, they say the north is dark. In African mystic science, the north is not dark. It is the place of the spirit world. It is the place from which life, the sources, the energy of life comes. Okay? So um, just I just wanted to show you this to show that the, this whole concept and things and dealings with the Freemasonry and what it talks about is not just in the Nile Valley. I could have put up something from the, the Dogon people who has this dance that they do every 72 years that the pattern that they dance in is the same orbital pattern of a star called Sirius B. Right, I could I could have put that up every seventy two years. Every seventy two years, right? And the people that do the dance is a secret society. Everybody don't just do the dance. You got to get initiated into that secret society and understand those secrets and understand how they deal with that and how they're able to. How long have they been doing that? You you think they got that from you think they got that from just being in the Mediterranean and they seen the um the um well the, the, Dog- the Greek do it no the Dogons weren't in the Mediterranean Dogons no. was in West Africa they actually talk about their ancestors coming from the Nile Valley they actually talk about how their ancestors come from the Nile Valley so I'm saying like maybe they got that secret society stuff from Greece. No, they got the secret society stuff from their ancestors from the Dal Valley that was handed down to them, right? Now, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I could I could have talked about Ifa, the tradition out of Nigeria, and where the the priests, when people come to them, they do they have this tray called the Opan Ifa tray. And the Opan Ifa tray also is divided into four sections, right? And each section has four what they call sacred odus or sacred stories. Now, that's 16 altogether. But a combination of those four 16 makes up 256 odus. But on the tray, is the same thing. The top represents life, the bottom represents death. The left side represents masculine, the right side represents feminine. But the center is called Ori Inu, which is the inner consciousness, your inner self, and who you are. And you are supposed to have balance in your life in things that you do. Ori Inu. So your Ori, your inner self, your inner consciousness is supposed to be balanced. 
and the understanding of the old dues helps you stay back. So, but I didn't put all that up because we would be here all day long. And yes, it's an initiatory process again. So I'm just saying that it isn't just the non-bound. The mystic science and, and culture of Africa is all throughout Africa and is still there if we want it, right? So do you know how long that, that, that they have been practicing that? Oh, this goes back thousands of years. They're, they're from the, the Congo, Christ? so they're, con they're from the Congo, so their relationship, the oldest people on so the planet. It wasn't just in North Africa. It was, no. it was way down in the Congo, too. Right. The okay. thing is, the thing that we have to understand, though, when we say Nile Valley, the Nile Valley is not just Egypt. Cairo. It goes all the way down, to, goes the all the way down to Newton. So some of those temples that they Most show. Of the pyramids yeah, are, are, are along the Nile. Along the Nile. 72, 72 of the oldest pyramids are lined up all throughout the Nile. So over 200 of them. Yeah. So, so it's not just the northern part of the Nile, which yeah. people, Cairo, where Cairo is. Is what we're talking about. Right. Africa was so so this is all it's all still there. It's all so, still there. So I'm saying so this is so they have been practicing this for thousands, thousands of years. Thousands of years. This is even they, before Christianity. They, right. Oh yes, this is way before Christianity. The oldest group of people on the planet are those real primitive people that we call that we look at called the Bushmen of the Kalahari. Their languages is a lot of times you will hear um, comedians kind of make fun of African language, right? And they, yeah. That is the oldest form of speaking. And the Dogon are descendants of, I mean, the Congo, the people of the Congo are descendants of those people. So their culture and their tradition goes back thousands of years, thousands of years. Hmm. So now I start to see why Pythagoras, Plato, Socrates, and all the Greek philosophers were persecuted for having non-Greek ideas. Thank you. If I'm correct, right? I think they all were killed. And they all were exiled. killed. They all were killed. Socrates' but sentence. Socrates' sentence was teaching a foreign ideology and corrupting the minds of the yeah, youth. That's exactly that was what, what Solomon's, I mean Solomon, that was what Socrates' sentence was. So that means that the knowledge that he had and that he was teaching didn't belong to Greece. Because how could he corrupt the minds of youth with their own information? So where did he go get this information from? Right. Well, considering the fact that the Masonic lodges are all Modeled after Egypt, but I imagine you didn't go to Asia and get them. Right. <laughs> well, we most, all know that. Most of most of the Greek philosophers, and I and I have had that slide, and I didn't put it in there. Most of the Greek philosophers um, traveled to Egypt. As we as I showed before, uh, Euclid was in Egypt, right? <laughs> so you're gonna find that all of the Greek philosophers oh, so traveled to Egypt to learn. That's why when you read in the Duncan's ritual, it says Pythagoras traveled to Asia, Egypt, and all those places before he came up with Eureka. I have found it because he found it elsewhere. He found it elsewhere. You see, what I'm saying? you really, I see, I understand. And the same, and the same with Euclid. You know, and so all of these, all of these philosophies and these things. Like I didn't even get into. We didn't even get into the the. I can't remember what what philosopher came up with this diagram that is, is um, uh, contrary. He called them the, the diagram of contrary when he talks about um, the basic elements of the universe. You know, earth, wind, air, fire, hot, cold, wet, dry. And the comedic in chemic is called the diagram of complementary. And it's showing that the universe function in complementary opposites. Hot, cold, wet, dry, air, water, 
or on the air, air, earth, water, fire, right? Which is why the very popular and the best band ever in music history, Earth, Wind, and Fire, why they were very much so in comedic Egyptian symbolism. Just like the Doors and right? Jim Morris, Jimi right. Hendrix. You got it? So then, conclusion, right? Even though, I'm just, right, even though I did not show you anything that directly said Freemasonry comes from Kim. I didn't show you anything that directly said based upon the facts that I have shown you, based upon the facts that I have put forth in this presentation, the only logical conclusion that can ever be come to is that ancient Africa, the Nile Valley, is the source of Freemasonry. All right. Say the main source. The main source of Freemasonry. And you know, some people are going to, again, you know, I'm just playing devil because you know what I'm saying. Right. Some people are going to argue that down to the depths of nothing and say, no way. Coincidence. No way. Well, yeah, and that's interesting, right? I believe, and I have no proof of this, just my experience, and that I believe that a good amount of European American Masons will agree that Egypt is the source of Freemasonry. And the ones who don't accept it will just be frowned upon. Right. The majority of the rejection that comes from the concept of Egypt being the source of Freemasonry is from African American Masons, probably specifically Prince Hall Masons. Why is that? And I think it is because of a mental enslavement that we have. That, that they really don't believe, and it's almost similar, I'm gonna say it's similar to why European Americans, Masons can say Egypt is from, uh, Egypt is a source of Freemasonry. There's some similarities of both things, and it's very interesting, I'm gonna explain it. I believe that a good amount of the African American Masons that reject Egypt being the source of Freemasonry, they really deep down do not reject Egypt being the source of Freemasonry. What they perceive is that when another African American Mason says to them that Egypt is the source of Freemasonry, they are saying African people is the source of Freemasonry. And they are rejecting that. If you was to stand up and say, Egypt was a multicultural civilization and the source of Freemasonry, probably not one African-American Mason will reject to that. But if you say Egypt was an African civilization and long before any other ethnic group came into Egypt, Egypt had already done all of the stuff that they're being praised for. Therefore, Egypt, the African civilization, is the source of Freemasonry, you're going to get a bunch of rejection. Now, on the flip side, European Americans said that Egypt is the source of Freemasonry because they don't believe Egypt is an African civilization. So they did not. So they, they'll say it. So they say, <laughs> they'll they, say it. You know, um, you know what? <laughs> you know what? You do, you do have a, a good point because I have a child of my woman who she's white. My oldest mm -hmm. daughter's mom is white. And she had on the necklace of Nefertiti one time. Mm -hmm. And she told me Nefertiti was not a woman of color. And I said she was. And she said, no, she wasn't because she was from Egypt. So I told her, Egypt's in Africa. She said, Egypt's not in Africa. This is, we were younger then because I knew her. I knew her every, every since we, I met her when we was in fifth grade. But she said, Egypt is not in Africa. And I said, yes, Egypt's in Africa. She said, are you sure? I see, I'm, I'm very positive. What I'm saying is her family taught her that Egypt had nothing to do with the continent of Africa. Exactly. A lot of people think Egypt is in the Middle East. You know, the Middle East is a fictitious 
category that they just made up out of thin air. It has it is separated no, classes. Right. They just call European. Right. They just made that up out of thin air. There's no such place as the Middle East. People have cultural paradigms, and that's how they identify themselves. So when you then look at what is the cultural paradigm that Egypt is made up from, it's African. In all that it does and how it deals with things, it's African. You know, it's on the continent of Africa. There's the 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 old. So if we look and we like, if you if we deal with European society today, France, England, Scotland, Germany, and we start dealing with their culture, we look back and start saying, okay, who lived this, this culture or the oldest in the form of this culture? And as we look back, we will start to go into Greece and Rome. But they got right? Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Stonehenge <laughs> was, it like? was made, was created by a group of people in Europe long before European culture, long before European culture. And when you go back and you study that, it comes from a group of people that is called the Druids. Yes. And the Druids was, was very much so into, right, what he called mystic science and all of that. Astrology. Which is right. Astrology, astrology yeah. astronomy, and all of that that comes, well, from, comes from ancient Kemet. It's, 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 it's very clear. So if you look back on, okay, let's look at where European society comes from, and you start to learn and see that, oh, European society was basically built from Greece and Rome. Well, then if we do the same thing, and we start looking at, well, let's look at the older forms of the Egyptian culture. And when you start to look at it, you'll see, oh, Nubia has an older form of Egyptian culture. And the Nubia is further south into Africa. And so the whole concept then is Nubian people gave birth to Egypt. And it's just that simple. And we can, you know, and, and it's, it's is everybody, you know, yeah. you know, I'm just throwing out that was I'm yeah. saying most people are just not gonna buy. It. Right. Even no matter what, because you gotta understand when we look in the history book, it's his story. So if I tell history of America from my point of view, history, it's going to be way different from what's right. in the book. Then we'll be learning right. about John Harson and guys right. like that. Right. So I, mean, I we, think we've been patterned to only accept history from one base of people. But then you have some people who are white historians. One thing I love about historians, either you tell it like it is, that makes you a historian. Right. That's the story that you just you just reporting on from the information that you get. But when you when you start telling history, it's it's the story as I want it to be. It's tainted at that right. point. You know, you can tell history or you can be a historian. 